You know, I don't even know why I'm the one here talking about trucks that are literally older than I am. Maybe it's because I've owned more of these than anything else, or that for some reason people have a strange fascination with this body style that hasn't been around for over 20 years. Don't act like you aren't also interested. I've seen the comments. Late OBS Ford. Tell us what you think about OBS Fords. What should I do with my OBS Ford? OBS Ford this, OBS Ford that. Well, good news guys. This whole video is about everything OBS Ford. Hosted by yours truly, Junior with Custom Offsets on the YouTube. If you've got an OBS Ford or any Ford or any truck, we've got you covered with wheels, tires, suspension, and performance accessories from customoffsets.com. I promise that something's gonna fit. These trucks have been out for like 28 years and have had plenty of time to develop aftermarket accessories and all that good stuff for them. So what exactly is an OBS Ford? The OBS Ford is the ninth generation of pick em up trucks from Ford Motor Company. The body style change started in 1992 and went until 1996. I know there was also like extended years with the heavy duty trucks into 98, but generally the body style range is just called 92 to 96. Just go with it. The 1992 introduction to the ninth generation F-150 showed off a new front end and honestly, that was kind of about it. The Bricknell's 8th gen F-150 was a major overhaul from the generation previous, and so the 9th gen didn't really do much besides, well, just make it look better. Nothing against the 8th gens, but it just looked extremely bland and basic with a Minecraft looking headlight assembly. It had like one brick for the headlight and one brick for the turn signal. It, it, it was very meh. Then all of a sudden 1992 hit and Ford came out with a beautiful Tetris filled headlight bezel with four parts to the headlight offering way too many bulbs that you need to buy when you're converting to LED. For real, I'm in that boat right now. So what about this old 90s design makes it one of the most iconic and desirable trucks before the round body came out? The fact that it was the last of a dying generation of square bodied vehicles mixed with the reliable engine options that came out for years and a multitude of customization options have kept this truck relevant even by today's standards. In addition, there were so many of these trucks that made it fairly easy to do a quick Craigslist search in some random city down south and find a clean one ready to pick up. I did that twice. So worth it. The interior is modern enough to give you like electric windows and electric lumbar support without feeling oddly try hard, wanna be futuristic, but extremely dated like the 10th gen F-150s became. You jump in, you have AC and functionality while still having that old truck feel, but not too old that it's unreasonable to daily drive. A good balance of old meets new, the OBS Ford was also the last generation that used their twin I-beam or twin traction beam or TTB or whatever you want to call it, wannabe IFS system, but kind of still was solid axle style rudimentary design. I'm not overly a fan of it and I know that there are tons of forums talking about the misconceptions and what the benefits and functionality of the TTBs are, but I just feel like they're better suited to jump in dunes and that's about it. Give it a solid axle if you want to off-road or a more normal 97 plus torsion bar suspension for daily driving. Eh, that's kind of my thought on it. But hey, the OBS F-150s also introduced some new tech after a few years of the body style, most notably including airbags, remote keyless entry, a CD player built into the stereo system. Like the CD player is like the disc, right? You put it in there and you listen to music, it's pretty cool. These changes over the course of the body style had Ford F-Series sales growing from a half million units sold in 92 when they first came out to almost 800,000 units by the time they ended in 1996. This overtook all GM sales for the first time in over a decade and put Ford truck sales on top. No wonder this is one of the most desirable body styles. They've been in demand and winning awards ever since the 90s. Of course, you can't talk about the OVS Ford without breaking down the different engine options that were all solid choices for your F-150 or F-250 or F-350 or Bronco, or you get the idea. Which one was the perfect choice for your Ford truck? It depends on who you ask and what your needs are. Let's start with the Ford 300 inline six. Most Ford enthusiasts know it and are probably, probably pumping a fist right now while I talk about the little engine that could. Don't get me wrong, this engine was not a performance engine. It was not fast, it didn't sound like a muscle car, but it got the job done and it did it well. This engine had been around since 1965 and was in everything, like, like literally everything. It was in generators, it was in wood chippers, it was in tractors, it was in dump trucks, it was probably in your UPS truck today. They were all over proudly boasting the ever reliable 300 inline six under the hood that kept them running. This engine was so solid that you'd be shifting gears in your F-150 with more holes in the truck than it was worth, and the engine would just keep chugging along even after the body had completely rotted off of it. If you don't believe me, the Ford forums talk about overheating them daily, running them without oil or coolant, and they still ran. Not that I'm gonna recommend that, but you get the idea. Next up, we have the old trusty 302 50 V8, kind of mainly just called the 302. 
Ford took what they've been experimenting with the 70s and 80s on their Mustangs and delivered a reliable V8 option to the F-Series lineup. Probably one of the most well-known and solid options, it got the job done. Although it may not have had the power for some scenarios, it ran great, pulled good, and in its 27 years had no major problems. Unlike its following generations of V8 with the 5.4 Triton that had Henry Ford rolling in his grave, but we're not gonna talk about those dark times. Ford brought back the 5.0 in 2011 with what most people refer to as the Coyote 5.0. Significantly more power, different tech, and just as reliable as the old 5.0 from back in the day, Ford kept the reputation of the 5.0 alive and well with their redesign. And I kind of think that's one of the coolest things about Ford. They know their history, they know their heritage, and they ensure that it's passed on through the generations. 5.0s, 7.3s, Rangers, Lightning's re-releasing, Broncos. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. If you wanted more displacement, Ford had an answer to that with the 5.8 liter 351. Now the big question is 351 Windsor or 351 Cleveland? That's one of the most asked questions everyone has after learning you're running a 351. Ask me how I know. The 351W is the more common option in the market and even without the high performance signification behind it, people had no issues adding lots of power additions through aftermarket bolt-ons for this engine. The more desired and powerful 351C was the good old Cleveland engine built in you guessed it, Cleveland, Ohio. This was the better flowing, more performance designed 351 with better cylinder heads and a four valve version that was geared for more power out of the box. But good luck getting your hands on one with the limited production years. There's something that still holds value in the Ford community by saying you've got a Cleveland under your hood, I guess. That's nasty. Now, Ford also had the 460 naturally aspirated big block engine as well, which was a workhorse V8 with plenty of power to back it. Thrown into performance cars and F-350s alike, this engine was a solid option ready for just about anything you could want. Who can complain with almost 300 horses and 400 foot-pounds of torque? With all of these options, it's no wonder that OBSs hold such a significant spot in the pickup truck lineage. I mean, look at all of these solid engine options. But you didn't think I was gonna stop there, did you? I can only imagine the comments. Holy sh Junior, you forgot Ford's best engine to date. What happened to the best diesel engine ever made? When is it gonna talk about the International? Well, don't worry, I was saving the best for last. That's right, the good old Ford 7 Tree. The best diesel engine to ever grace Earth. That may be a little bit of a stretch since Dustin insists that his LBZ is the best thing to ever turn over in this world, but I can argue my 7.3 might just be a little bit cooler. The early OBS Fords had the IDI 7.3 International engine, which was a great workhorse diesel engine. Hard to overheat, reliable, and after people started putting miles on them, they realized that these engines were capable of like a half million miles before any major maintenance was required. The 7.3 had been around since 86, so there was plenty of time and experience from drivers to show that this engine could take it all. It sounded like a tractor and runs just about as slow, but hey, you can throw just about anything behind it and it'll pull it without a second thought. Oh, that's not enough for you? One of the best running and lowest maintenance diesel engines out there just ain't gonna cut it for you? Well, Ford decided that they weren't done yet. In 1994, Ford slapped a turbo onto the 7.3 to get it to 225 horsepower and 450 foot-pounds of torque. It may have been missing an intercooler and could have used a larger transmission cooler for hauling all the heavy loads that the almost 500 foot-pounds of torque delivers, but hey, Ford got excited and did something sweet, all right? The OBS 7.3 is probably the best of both worlds. Sitting at the precipice of a new millennium with newly introduced technology on the horizon, you've got one of the most iconic body styles of all time, running essentially one of the best bulletproof engines ever with new diesel tech slapped onto it. And ooh, baby, you're set up for success with one of the best of everything. Can you tell I like these trucks? I liked them so much that I kind of accidentally spontaneously bought one of them from the last year they were ever made before they disappeared forever. True story. Now, the transmission options that these trucks had may have been subpar at best, but hey, you can't win them all. Get that E4OD rebuilt and strengthened up a bit and you'll be all set for the entire future. Kinda, maybe. Keep in mind that these trucks are now like 25 years old and not everything is built to last forever, so expect some maintenance will be needed to get your truck running by today's standards. While talking about today's standards, we all expect Bluetooth, massaging leather seats, LED interior lighting, Bose sound system, and a 360 bird's eye view. While today you have more trim levels and packages than I can even keep track of, back in the OBS days there were like five options, and you could argue that like two of them were more or less exclusive and not so easy to get. So three options, XL, XLT, and the Eddie Bauer edition. Back in 1994, you were lucky to have an actual radio with a CD player and actual real aluminum wheels. That was your luxury trim options on your XLT, which didn't even meet base trim package requirements now. 
but that's okay because in 1995, Ford released the Eddie Bauer edition to their F-150 and Bronco line, which had nicer interior trim, a better standard features like illuminated running boards and two-tone leather interiors, also included with the Eddie Bauer edition was the iconic two-tone with a tan trim around the bottom of the truck and painted to match tan on the Bronco topper as well. What better image for Ford than Eddie Bauer's quality, durability, versatility, and outdoor exploration? It's no wonder that they were paired with the extremely off-road ready and capable Ford Bronco. Yeah, okay, we get it. Ford Bronco, OJ, you probably expect me to go on a long story about how OJ Simpson made the Ford Bronco famous in his world famous slow speed chase. You probably expect me to talk about how this actually wasn't his Bronco that was driving. It was his good friend Al Cowlings, and OJ wasn't even driving, he was in the back seat. And you probably expect me to tell you that it was because he killed his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Wait, no he didn't. Wait, yes he did? I don't know. You probably expect me to tell you that the Juice had his own Bronco back home, but it wasn't the iconic white one we see crawling through the streets of LA. He had a white one, but that was allegedly taken as evidence of the case later destroyed, even though it wasn't the one involved in the chase. You probably expect me to talk about Rob Kardashian, how he made his future family insanely wealthy and famous, and they're kind of just known for being famous for doing nothing, because it was all him. Who gets famous for doing nothing? Like how? Sign me up, dude. You probably expect me to share the whole story that made the Bronco a staple and running joke for all white Broncos even today, but hey, I'm not gonna talk about any of that. Wait a minute. The OBS4 Bronco, which was also the fifth generation of Bronco, if you can keep up with all these numbers and generations, had all of the features and benefits of the OBS F-150s and had the same frame and suspension and engine options. This was back before SUVs were a thing and these multi-purpose vehicles were ready for anything. The trail and off-road capabilities that the Bronco offered were known by all and its reputation was amazing. I kind of love them, I've gone through like two in the last two years. But sadly, on June 12, 1996, the last Bronco rolled off the production line, never to be seen again. That is, until 2020, when Ford introduced the all-new Ford Bronco, offering two-door and now four-door variants. This new truck was ready to pick up exploration right where the last generation left off 25 years prior, and Ford frickin' killed it. We all saw how disappointed the Chevy Blazer turned out in 2019, essentially just a glorified crossover. Ford didn't really have to do much to raise the bar from there, pretty much anything would have been better than that. They brought out a new body that offered strikingly similar features and body lines to the first generation of Ford Bronco from like 80 years ago, a long time ago. Like I said earlier, Ford knows and understands their history and what makes them who they are. They have a story that they tell over and over and it never fails to disappoint. But the Ford Bronco wasn't the only cool thing that Ford was doing back in the 1990s and isn't the only thing being brought back today. Rewinding a little, as the world of cars and technology grew in the 80s, cars got faster and racing was making its comeback as manufacturers adjusted to how vehicles were built. The Oil Crisis and Clean Air Act halted muscle cars for a bit, and the 80s introduced a fresh breath of air for enthusiasts across the country. Ha! Get it? Fresh breath of air. Clean Air Act. That's funny. Come on. General Motors seemed to have something figured out with their performance division as they dropped the Chevy 454 SS in 1990 and a sweet little pickup called the GMC Cyclone in 1992. Right in stride, Ford was there in 1993 with their answer, the Ford Lightning. 240 horse and 340 foot-pounds of torque, this 5.8 liter in a single cab, short bed, lower pickup truck was ready to lay some rubber. In addition to Ford coming out of the box with something new and purpose built, Ford partnered with companies like Centurion, DeBrian, and Magnum making custom conversions. These are the iconic four-door Broncos that you sometimes see out there. Now, a little bit of history here, there aren't four-door Broncos. Well, most of them aren't. From what we can find, Centurion, probably the most well-known, and Magnum, no, wrong Magnum, used a Ford truck chassis and added Bronco sheet metal, with themselves finishing off the conversion, building the rest on their own. DeBrian conversions were the only ones that actually started with a Bronco body and converted that vehicle then to a true four-door Bronco. They only made 35 of these four-door Broncos and only two were known in existence up until recently, both of them being the previous Bronco body style. Apparently, CP addicts found one of the only known OBS DeBrian Broncos out there are in the process of restoring it. Neat little factoid. But Centurion being one of the biggest conversions out there for Broncos also outfitted F-250s and 350s, giving them a crew cab with an extended cab, custom paint and interior, or a four-door truck with a Bronco rear end. They thought outside of the box, and the 90s were kind of a weird time for customization, okay? Wall dock conversions were another popular option, and even today you still see a few trucks rolling around with stripes up all down the side with questionable color choices throughout. Everyone wanted to get their hands on these OBS Broncos and show that they had what it took 
to elevate the OBS4 to the next level with a little bit of a custom touch. So yeah, okay, it's not 1992 anymore and there's a lot of technology and advancements since then and you're wondering what mods you can do to your OBS4 to get it up to today's standards or even make it a custom showpiece. First off, I suggest ripping the old purple tint off and having that baby retinted with current day ceramic window tint, which is ironic that I say that because I haven't done that on my Bronco or my Dually yet. Do as I say, not as I do. You'll also see a lot of guys or girls taking their OBS boards and tossing a solid axle underneath it. Get rid of the annoying twin eye beam traction beam thing and put something solid and reliable under there. Ride Motorsports makes a plug and play 05 plus Super Duty axle swap kit that bolts right to your OBS frame then allows the new Super Duty axles and suspension to be bolted onto that. So it's kind of like an adapter if you want to call it that, I guess, I don't know. One of my favorite things about Ford is that you'll kind of see like Ford enthusiasts, right? Taking from the newer generations and swapping onto older ones and keeping that same history and style throughout the years, which leads to another mod that you can do to your OBS. A lot of the guys will take newer Super Duty seats and retrofit them to fit into their OBSs as well. Newer, comfier, and looks good too. While you're making the interior more enjoyable, there are companies like OBS Interiors that make dual DIN radio bezels for a touchscreen radio or even an iPad dash. That alone really modernizes the interior and gives you a lot of the functionality and features that today's vehicles have. Obviously, there are lift kits for these for days, and if you're not doing a full solid axle swap, the kits are relatively easy. You got springs in the front and blocks in the rear. Upgrading to a radius arm kit is always a good option too, whether you just do it for the looks or if you actually plan to use your truck and do some crawling with it. After suspension, there's obviously wheels and tires with a ton of options you can check out in our gallery to see what fits. Customoffices.com slash gallery, little plug there. There's also some things you can do like updating all of your interior lights to LEDs, going with a clear or black housing headlight and taillight to update the looks of your truck. Of course, rock lights and wheel lights are always a good option too. And conveniently, that's all available through customoffsets.com. So yeah, that was a lot. I'm wiped, but in short, what makes the OBS Ford so cool? You've got the solid engine options, interiors focused on you, the customer, platforms like the Bronco and Lightning to give everybody an option to get into an F-Series truck, and even just the, the looks of the body itself. Like, damn, there's not much better than a clean OBS Ford. So while everyone else is investing in stocks and Dogecoin and all of these cryptocurrencies, it's probably not too far off to start stocking up on clean OBS Ford since it's a pretty solid investment that's only gonna go up with time on the soon to be classic body style. I mean, I know I'm already on the right track with my small collection. Thank you guys for watching and make sure you subscribe for more videos like this on customoffsets.com, youtube.com slash customoffsets TV. Peace.